I want to thank everybody for coming today to the court accounting class. Exciting stuff, accounting, you know, wake me up when it's over kind of stuff. But it's required, and when you get a court order to uh, do accounting, it changes your perspective. And it makes it more relevant. So what the plan is for today is the presentation that we've given in the past is a uh, three hour program. We've given it over at the Law Library in Contra Costa County Superior Court several times over three or so years. And it was originally designed for pro per litigants who were presenting their own case without an attorney in the area of a guardianship for minors, conservators for uh, uh, incapacitated ad adults. Uh, it is also applies to probate cases and powers of attorney uh, when you're handling someone else's money. And then it uh, also applies to trust accounting when a trust decides to have their accounting approved by the court, which is sometimes a real good idea because it cuts off liability in the future for um, beneficiary uh, countersuits. So this material that we're using is from the Judicial Council of California. And I point that out to you because hopefully you have the PDF in front of you and um, you probably don't have this page, but I wanted to show you the cover. We're only gonna be handling a couple sections out of this book. It's free, it's online, and it is oh, probably 170 pages long. And so if you're a guardian conservator, or you want more information, this book is online and you can access it for free and it's, it's good information. Um, our former probate judge, Judge Sugiyama, had worked on this program to get this going. And the last edition here says 2016. So I direct you to that book if you have an interest in getting more information. We have extracted most all of the accounting issues. So what are we going to do here? First, there's, I'll give you another overview. And that is, when you're doing a court accounting, there's basically three parts. It's nine o'clock. Okay, so um, the, the components of the court accounting are, first of all, you have an inventory and appraisal. And next you have the accounting itself with all the numbers. And then the third part is a report or petition where you, some people call it just a report or cover letter. Um, and that is where you're talking to the judge what you want done. Please approve this. Please pay the conservator fee. Uh, please pay our attorneys and you explain things. We'll go through all the details, but those are the, the major components. Inventory and appraisal, the accounting report itself, and um, the report with the petition. So uh, my assistant Tamara is going to be here in a moment and this is her section. So um, I will um, let her give you more information on that when um, in a moment when she checks in here. I'll, I'll give you uh, another, I'll just change subjects for a second while she's getting set up. Um, Okay, so this is a GC 400, and this is the cap sheet for all the accounting. Oops. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. 
Fine. So anyway, this is the sheet we'll pivot around. This entire class pivots around the GC400. And uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn the microphone and video over to my assistant, Tamara Brown, who will explain the components of the inventory and appraisals. Here's Tamara Brown. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hello. Yeah. I can't see anybody, so. Yeah, that's, I don't have them up. This okay, so, uh, well, first of all, I want to back up, I'll apologize, I was running a few minutes behind, but I want to back up, I need, I want to know, so I see Gwendolyn James, I don't know if he's asked already, but um, can we start with each person kind of telling me, um, what exactly your case is or what you're wanting to learn or where you're from perhaps we could start with gwendolyn yeah i'm sorry and well um my case is i'm trying to get conservatorship i have power attorney the conservatorship of my mom and her state she's uh, 87 or 88 years old i can't remember time. <laughs> time is within the last year it seems like it's zooming so right still 87 should be 88 in november um she's in a care home now i had to come out here from utah because my brother died unexpectedly and i had a sister to die right behind him and they were taking care, care of my mother and um when i got here it was just so overwhelming because um, she's a veteran's wife, widow of a, you know, and trying to get through to the veterans without having a conservatorship is, you know, it's like pulling your teeth without anesthesia, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a pain. And then social security, because they don't recognize power attorneys. Right. And, um, you know, she has a home. And so being able to try to keep up with her mortgage and um, the house is in ill repairs. So I'm working to, to fix it so that it will be livable for her to come home. Yeah, so the, Wayne, I had a question. I, the home, is the home a California property? Yes, here okay. in um, where I'm, I, I'm at right now. So I'm here at her home. And um, I had quit my federal job and I just, Wow. Finished a federal background check. Yay. So hopefully yeah, I'll good get, job. get a new one at um, Travis Air Force Base where she goes to the hospitals and stuff. And so I'll be there at work when the caregivers and my sisters bring her in to see her doctor that she's been with Travis pretty much the whole time she's, you know, lived here. Okay, so, Glenn, I have another question. Have you already been appointed? No. No? Okay. I no. Didn't because it was, it, it's just so much dysfunctionalism in my home. So, um, and with all the, the siblings, so um, there was a marker when I got ready to be the power attorney because of all the past siblings. And so um, they weren't able to finish up their background, whatever, and check to see what all of her, um, um, uh, adult protection services um, cases that were out there, I think 17 of them. So they all assumed that it was from me. And yeah. all so when I talk we're going to gonna, we're gonna have to move on, Gwendolyn. Okay, uh, so let me just I, make I'm this. sorry to have to interrupt you, but we uh, we wanted to find out what uh, you know the status of everybody's case is. Okay. And uh, now so we is, have a good I, So can I just end this with uh, the when the judge found out I just moved here after 39 years being away, she realized all of those things were not against me. So she wants me to write a letter and my sister read letter. So I have another case here on the 29th of July, and I think everything will be okay. Yeah, just uh, fill out all the details and yes. make the declaration, whatever they need. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. So You're welcome. Uh, the next person I have is called Staff. Okay. Is anyone here respond to the name 
staff. Okay. We yes. have another person here named Ed. Oh, wait. Uh, yes, my oh. name is Joanne Watson. I'm one of the law librarians here. I work for Contra Costa County Public Law Library. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to give me a call. My name is Joanne. I'm happy to see that some of you did finally get through because I know I assisted some of you yesterday. So welcome. Yeah, and uh, I also wanted to tell you, Joanne is very helpful. She acts as my uh, part-time psychologist. If I have any problems, uh, talk to her. She can solve anything. Okay. Uh, Thank you. There we go. You're in. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, that was Joanne, and I see uh, Eric. I think I know Eric. Hi, Eric. Uh, just a second, Eric. You might have to unmute yourself. I'm trying to get you unmuted, but I'm I'm a little. There you go. You're unmuted. Good morning, Mr. Crandell and Tamara. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. How are you, honey? I'm well. So I've been conservator for uh, two years, and uh, my next accounting is due a year from today. And we have a new judge. We have two new judges in Contra Cost Accounting. Ah, but for your case, yes. Thank you for doing the class. Yes, and I also have to let everybody know that uh, Eric had taken the class once before, so if he asked questions way beyond the beginning, that's that's the reason. So the next person I'd like to talk to is Erica. Let's see if I can get you unmuted. Oh, you are unmuted. Go I, ahead. I, I unmuted myself. Good morning. Um, I actually have a new trust and estates practice and I am going to, I'm do, currently doing a trust administration and in October the accounting is coming up and I have never done one. So I'm eager to learn and thank you for putting the class on. Okay. Um, yeah, we're uh, trying to get some increased volume going on this side. Um, Sorry, Erica, and so is your case here in Contrasta? Um, actually, it'll be in Alameda County. Okay. I'm good. You want to? Uh, I'm going to come to yours. You, you want? want you want to continue? Fine. Very, very cool. Okay. Um, is there anybody else? Yes. Uh, okay. So we. James. James is. Uh, more of uh, James is from uh, uh, I'm just recording uh, it. Mm. Versatate, so okay, Julie. Julie, okay, so unmute. You got her unmuted, so Julie should be able to talk now. Julie, Hi. I'm Julie Westerling. I am a solo practitioner in trusts and estates. I have done two accountings, and the attorneys had very different styles. So I'm curious to find out <laughs> the right way to do it and looking forward to it. And are you from um, the Bay Area? Yes, I live in San Ramon. Okay. And um, I'll be handling Contra Costa accountings. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. I'm gonna meet you back. And I have Leslie. Leslie Hi. Marks. Hi, um, I'm just here to learn because I've taken the class a couple years ago. And apparently I've forgotten everything except my name. So I <laughs> You're <laughs> good. This stuff right. <laughs> okay, you're good. And I know about you. So I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna mute you back and I'm gonna go on no, to the next. I I'm gonna tell you something else about Leslie Mark. She is a great person. She's real cheerful, bubbly boy, and seen around the courthouse. She uh, really does a good job. So uh thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm you and you, and we're going on to the next. Okay, now I have um, Artanga T. Artanga. Tango T. Is, you have to unmute it. Sorry. Okay, I, I think we got you unmuted. No. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. I'm Mona Pure 40. I am in probate, and I'm here to learn. It's best to stay ahead of the curve instead of in back of it. It, the probate for me, I was... I'm okay, so could you talk a little louder for me, please? Okay, I'm Mona 
and I'm here to learn all that I can. I am in probate now. Okay. And so I was behind the curve and I figured let's get ahead of the curve and learn all you can. In the okay, event. sweetie, tell me a little bit about your probate. Is it for a relative? My son, yes. Okay. And um, so he uh, has an estate or an estate and you're going through. Um, when were you appointed? March 12th of this year. Oh, good. So you have a little while, but you, we got to get you started. I've, yeah, I'm halfway through, but I figured this conservatorship, you know, my family, we're all in our 70s, you know, so I said in the event, I'll at least ha have a little bit of knowledge and it won't be so difficult, you know, if I have this knowledge beforehand. Instead right. Of going Good through job. It. Good job. Good job. Okay, and, guys. I'm going to get started because um, we only have a short time frame. Well, first I'm going to ask, um, did any, did I miss anybody? Maybe send a message if I did. Otherwise I'm going to just keep going on. Okay. I don't see anybody. So I'm going to go ahead and um, switch over. Uh, I need you to switch over to the GCO forum. You want what GC four hundred? This one, that inventory in the first. Okay. Uh, what is this? Inventory in the first. Okay, guys. I'm gonna start off with one of the first, or the first thing that you will need to get started. If you have already done this, or if you're past this part, please just listen. I'm gonna try and go through it somewhat quickly but um slower for ones that this is their first time seeing it okay so i'm gonna go ahead and just go through this form this is a little bit different teaching for me because i'm usually doing this in person um but we're gonna go through this form and please understand this is just my sample so you can um you will not you know use the exact county and stuff like that but i'll tell you the things to fill in so we're going to start um let me just go back a little bit and tell you that um this portion of the um of the starting of your conservatorship or guardianship um, this inventory and appraisal is due in 90 days. It's that's quick. That's super super fast um, And keep in mind that if you have to send it off to a probate referee, which means you have non cash assets He a probate referee can typically take four weeks. So if they take four weeks and you only have 90 days to get it filed with the court you need to start acting as quick as what, possible. I'll get to that when we get down there. So I'm going to start off with how to complete the form. Um, the form you will see when you get it will be completely blank. So again, the names that are in here are just for reference. So at the very top, um, where it says attorney or party for attorney, Right now it shows an attorney as if he's filling it out. So I'm going to tell you that it does not need to be completed by legal counsel and you can complete this on your own. What you would do is on the first line item, um, you would put your name, mm -hmm. you would put your address and your city and zip code. You would put your telephone number, and if you had one, a fax number, and your email address. In this line item where it says David Lowry Conservator, right there you would write the words P-R-O and then space P-E-R, which means pro per which means you're handling it on your own.
Okay, the next line item is Superior Court of California. I'm going to use the example as if you're filing at Contra Costa Martinez um, Courthouse. So um, again, this should go according to whatever county and address of the court that you're filing in. So right here, it would be Superior Court of California, County of Contra Costa. The street address is 725 Court Street, and that is Department 14, Room 212. For their mailing address, it will be P.O. Box 911. How funny. Then we have the City Martinez, California 94553. And it doesn't necessarily have a branch name. Okay, the next box we will move down to says a state of. In that box, you will put the person that is getting the care. Whether the care, uh, the care person is a decedent, they're not getting care right now, but um, you're taking care of their estate. So that's, sorry about that. Or there's a conservative or there's a minor. So you will mark the appropriate box. Again, for a, pro, um, for a probate, it would be a decedent. For a guardianship conservatorship, it'd be a conservatee. And then if it's for a child, then it's a minor. Over here, we will come where it asks for the case number. That would be your case number. And the box below is the date of your appointment. So the date your letters are received. I mean, your date your letters are approved, signed, um, judge stamped. Okay, I'm gonna come back to this section where it says inventory and appraisal. Typically, you will always do a final unless you've already done one and say, for instance, it was wrong. They tell you you have to go back and get it cor or correct it. Um, but typically, it's gonna be marked final. Okay, I'm gonna slide down to the next section which is total appraisal by the representative guardian or conservator and it says attachment number one is everybody okay with my speed do you want me to slow down is You're everybody fine. good good okay good. perfect so where it says attachment um number one and again, I don't know how Rex has these organized here. Uh, on the left, you have, uh, click see. the second one down to get the Here we one. go. So this is the attachment number one. You will complete it at the top that, that says a state of, again, that's the same name you put on the first page, and the case number. This will already be pre, um, we'll already have this header up here. Now what you will include, and again, this is tip, all this area is typically blank. So uh, in my example, I've given way more than most people will possibly have. Again, it's only an example. So if you do not have all seven of these items, only include what you have. Don't feel that you need to write the words and then put zero over here, okay? What this is, is your first line item, and it doesn't have to go in this order either, but it's a nice reference, would be any type of cash you found at the house or at the residence or at their care facility that they had on them the day you were appointed. 
And what we like to say is, okay, where did you find it? Did you find it at their house, in their car, in their wallet more than likely? Um, but you do want to state um, it was cash. They probably have it in their wallet and um, most people do um, unless it's really a minor. Um, and so you would put the amount of cash that they had on them. Okay, the second example is the balance in a checking account. I like to state where the checking account is or the branch typically um, that they normally go to or the branch. That's something that you'll really want to become familiar with um, the people at the branch because they could probably help you a whole lot if you really needed. Um, and what you will do is you will actually ask them or find out what was the balance in the account the day you received your letters? It's not the end of the month. It's not the next day. It's not a week before. It's not the last balance um, or the last um, statement you got at the bank. No, it's nothing like it's the day you got your letters. Okay, so that's the number that will go right here. Excuse me, can yes. I ask a quick question? Absolutely, hon. Okay. Um, when you say the day we got our letters, once we get approved and it's stamped, that's the day you're referring to? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next one is a savings account. Again, it would follow the same manner. It's the day of appointment. They don't have a savings account. Of course, you would not list that um, there. The next example is um, a certificate of deposit. Again, you're going to find out if they have one. A lot of people don't. So again, you wouldn't use this as an example. Now, if you happen to go over their house on your appointment date and you found in the mail that they have a retirement or some type of check that has come payable to them, whether it's an, you know, whether it's a pension or, you know, whatever it could be, you would list that there. I know nowadays most times they're direct deposited. Um, so you, you know, would not lists that that would come later. This is only if it's uncashed and not in the bank. Again, another example is a social security check because you got uh, your letters on the fourth and typically social security um, issues payments on the third and the check came, and so you want to make sure you list it before you take in, put it in the bank. Oops, and then we have the next one, which is a mutual fund. Again, that's just an example. Once you have listed, again, this is cash only, cash or cash equivalent, sorry, because it could be in form of paper that really is a check. So this does not include furnish, it will get to that part, this does not include furnishings, the car, anything else, jewelry, anything. This is cash only. Okay, at the very bottom of the form, you'll see where it says total cash assets. You will take your, um, you will take all of your totals that you have along this side and you will total them right here at the bottom. Now this number is very important because this is the exact number at the bottom of this form that you will transfer to line one. And the probate examiners or the um, uh, probate clerks 
we'll make sure that those two numbers match. Oh. Okay, so basically what you're doing with this form is you're telling the judge that when I walked in on in the house or when I walked in to assess all the assets, this is what I found. So this is a stopped point in time. I walked in, this is what I found. Okay, everything from this minute on I'm responsible for. And again, you're responsible for all of this sitting right here. Okay, are we ready to move on? Everybody got that or should I go back? Any questions? All good. Okay, perfect. Now line number two says total appraisal by referee. Now, usually what will happen is when you're doing a probate or um, a conservatorship, if um, the judge feels that there are non-cash, and that's very important, non-cash assets, a probate referee will be assigned to you and it's at the bottom of your paper. A lot of times they'll assign a probate referee and you may never need one or not use the person um, because you didn't find any um, non-cash assets. So again, this section right here by the probate referee, which is attachment two, will be left blank by you. You are not to fill that out. That is done by the probate referee. And I will get into the attachment number two and what you're responsible for. So you will complete the estate of, you will put the case number. Again, this section is already completed. And you will tell the probate referee what you would like him to place a value on. Again, these are only examples. So if you do not have these, please don't put them there um, and have them do extra work. So we'll go through the um, all of the items that are non-cash that a probate referee is, we're asking him to put value on. The first one is real property. In the city of, and it, this example is Newport Beach, County of Orange, State of California, you have to describe as best you can so that probate referee knows how to look up, find value, um, and determine the value that he will place here. So you can see this example lists everything that we know about the property. In the second example for this person, they had a vacation home. So at that point, we've stated where it is, the how it's recorded, what county, what's the address, the assessor parcel number. And we are asking again the probate referee to give us value. In example number three, you have household furniture and furnishings. At what address? This is where the person lives. So typically I've seen with a probate referee, they kind of may I call back and ask, well, is the furniture brand new? It, you know, uh, has it been there since um, 1920? You know, that's a difference in value or they will just give kind of like their own solid little number. It's typically not a lot, but it's a value. We've also stated in example number four that they have shares with Safeguard Investment Mutual Fund. Now it's really important, again, the day you get your appointment that you find out that they have shares somewhere and or you find a statement and you find out how many shares um, they have. And again, it is not up to you to list what the value of those shares are over here. That is the probate referee's job. 
So again, you just list how many shares. Okay, example number five says there are seven $100 US savings bonds that were issued on this date. I'm not sure many will have that as on their um, inventory and appraisal, but maybe. Again, you do not give value, you leave that blank. Oops, the next one shows a um, diamond ring two carrots this is extremely important and i'll just go through a few things that ha can happen and why it's important there are when um beneficiaries feel that they've struck gold because sooner or later they're going to be millionaires from grandma or whomever this person is that's aging they think that again they're already counting their stars before or counting their chickens before they actually hatch and so it is really important to list for instance a diamond ring now me myself i couldn't tell you a two carat from a one carat from a ten carat well i probably could tell you if it was ten carat i would say that's big that's all i could probably say but i wouldn't have a clue so just do your best because again i i'm not a diamond expert and i really would have no clue um i really don't even wear diamonds <laughs> so so i don't get that lucky so again you may you can say i think it is or also the good thing is is maybe take a picture of it and send it to, or with a probate referee just a picture of what it looks like the good thing with that is, okay, say for instance, you have a uh, brother of yours that you may not get along with very well, or you did get along, but now you're not getting along or something like that. When something happens to, say for instance, your mom, and she should pass, and then you're ready to kind of put the assets together for and get ready for like a total, so you know what distribution will be. You sell off a one carat ring and get, let's say $1,000. But brother thinks that it was a 10 carat ring and you should have got $10,000, so you cheated him out of $9,000. There's gonna be problems. He's going to come in and possibly go to court and say, okay, what was it? And I think you're stealing stuff and you're cheating me out of money and blah, blah, blah. You can show that at the time of your appointment, you took a picture or whatever of the ring. It really was only two carats. Where he got 10, you don't know, or you've never seen the ring and you're not responsible for it. So again, list everything you see. Um, the other th examples we've had on this page, if there are any animals, um, and I use animals as far as like, for instance, a horse that's worth um, typically quite a bit of money, you would state um, the horse if you know what type of breed it is, if not okay, where the horse is located, um, the stables, etc. If it's on the property, of course, state that. And then you will just um, provide those other things. Um, now, a dog or a cat, unless it's a prize show dog or cat, I don't think I would, um, or I wouldn't include that at all because really what is their value to the person that you're a conservator for um that cat is worth a billion dollars but to anybody else the cat people might not even like the cat so <laughs> what's the value so um again you wouldn't include that on there so at the very bottom where it says total non-cash assets this will be left blank that's not um, for you to be responsible for. Okay, once you've completed this page now, and you've completed the top portion, 
see if I can go back. There we go. Um, again, you leave this blank because you will send this form, page two, and, uh, or actually all the pages I like to send, but really, and then this attachment to a probate referee. But we'll get into that also a little bit more as we go down the form. Okay, so before we're gonna finish completing the form so that we can send it to the probate referee. So in line number three, you will mark the box that attachment one, again, here's attachment one, which is the cash. Um, and attachment two, which is the probate referees page. are true and correct statements and you're saying all of it's true and correct you're not stating <laughs> which would be interesting how you would say oh only a portion of it's correct i lied on the other parts but um <laughs> i couldn't imagine anybody marking that box but i guess that's their way of um <laughs> making sure you're telling a true statement okay line number four this is um, going to be marked either if there are no non-cash assets and you do not need a probate referee, you would mark this box. But if there are non-cash assets and you need a probate referee, you would mark this box. And you would put the date that you received your letters or the judge assigned the probate referee right here. You would type that in. Okay, regarding the number five, the property tax certificate. This does not apply to guardianships or conservatorships. Basically, it's only for an executor or an administrator of a probate. And basically you're going to state whether property tax have been satisfied or not. Leave it blank if you do not have property tax. Okay, moving down, you will see you're declaring that it's a true and um, correct statement. It's date, you will put a date here, but it, what's extremely important, and you have to remember this, is you will not sign it until you receive it back from the probate referee. Do not sign it and send it ahead of time. You can date it and put your name here because that doesn't matter, but do not sign it until you receive it back from the probate referee. And so what happens, um, jumping ahead a little bit, is once you've completed this form, and again, the attachments, you will send the entire package off to the probate referee. He will fill in, apologize, the values right here, and he will provide a total at the bottom, and then he will fill in this place right here with a number okay he, then he will also complete page two which is his declaration you do not fill out any of this except for the top headers he will date it and i'm saying he it could be a she apologize they will date it and type their name and then sign it and then again, they will return the entire package back to you. Occasionally, I've seen that they will put a total here, but it's up to you to verify if they did not put a total, you would take this top number and the number he provided and you will indicate a total number there. It's really, really important and I'll tell you why as we move along to the next section but you will need this total. 
because this total better match another form that will come a little later or your entire accounting will not be passed. Okay, I'm gonna slide down. Is there any questions? Again, please tell me if I'm going too fast, if I need to stop and clarify something more or um, if you don't get it. Oh, wow. I'm loving you guys today. Do you have to attach bank statements? Is a question, Leslie, yes, ma'am. They must be the original bank statement. They cannot be a photocopy. They, it, they can be printed by the bank, but only if the bank certifies those printings. The court will not accept your accounting, and that's the other portion. This does not have to include bank statement. It's only your accounting, which we'll move to. So I'll get into a little bit more of that as we get down to that section. Okay, let's continue completing this form because we're almost done. The next section says statement about a bond. When you are um, given your letters or, um, well, when you're given your letters, the judge will determine whether a bond is needed or not. Uh, again, it's completely up to the judge. A lot of times, say for instance, for a probate, if there was a trust or, but somebody might, be worried about the validity of it or so there could be a few reasons why a bond is waived but that's not typical a bond is and i will tell you a bond they're really not that expensive but a bond protects cash and cash only so in this case and somebody can pipe up because I'm going to see if I'm going to test you guys. We have cash of $57,000 up here. Do you think that you would need a bond or not? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so you would mark this box. And then typically your bond is for a tiny bit more, like say $60,000. Then that covers everything. And then you can tell the judge, okay, I have a sufficient bond. Now, in some cases, when you've um, gone to court to get your letters, you may think, oh, I only have 30,000 in cash, or you're gonna ask to, you know, estimate for the judge, oh, there's only 30,000 in cash. And they state, okay, uh, show us a bond for 30000 But then when you actually do the appraisal, you find fifty-seven. Which box do you think you're going to mark right here? Your bond is only 30000 Insufficient. Which one would you mark? insufficient correct good job leslie so you would tell the judge i realize that i have a bond for thirty thousand. i do have cash of almost 60. i believe it's insufficient and we let the judge determine whether he asks you to increase the bond or he says he's okay with just that bond amount now, the old judge, Sugiyama, that I'm, you know, used to in Contra Costa County, would require you to increase your bond amount, typically. But with the two new judges, I believe they would follow suit, but I, I don't know. I haven't been in front of either one of them yet. So, again, you tell the judge so that they can just quickly look at this and go, Oh, good. $60,000 bond. There's only 57 in cash. Yes, it is sufficient. They've completed this properly. Okay. Now, the only other reason or box you would mark, 
and this would have to do typically if it's a minor, would be if this 57,000 in cash assets that you've listed up here was put into a blocked account, and I have several of those I've done because it was a minor, I would put, I have receipts for 57, 59 they're in a blocked account at Wells Fargo in Concord or Walnut Creek. If they're in a blocked account, meaning you cannot touch them, you do not need a bond because again, you can't touch them. So you wouldn't accidentally spend even a penny of the money again because you cannot touch it and try going to the bank and withdrawing from a blocked account. You need the judge and the and almost the president to give you something for them to allow you to remove. So it's not going to happen. So is everybody clear about the bond section? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So then once you've completed this section down here, we get to date, your name, and then again, your signature. We're ready to move on to page two. And again, we've already looked at page two. So again, page two only has the name of the estate whether it's a decedent, a conservatee, or a minor, and then the case number. And again, this is left blank, not to be completed by you. But one thing that you will want to maybe keep in mind is when you receive it back from the probate referee, you want to see that he's completed this. If he hasn't, that means you send it back and say, he, uh, I noticed that page two was not um, was not complete. So please fill it out so I could send it in. And that's the entire package, hon. You've completed again the entire package. Now I'm going to go um, because Mr. Crandell takes actually the next section, which is the summary of account. And I don't see that up here on his uh, a second uh, um, up here. But again, see these numbers. It's very oh important that these numbers. I just moved the. Sorry about that. These numbers in line one and two, and the total that comes right here is extremely important for the next section, which is the summary of account or the GC four hundred. So again, these numbers are what you, it's gonna start your accounting. If these numbers are any different than what you show on your starting accounting, it will be rejected. Okay, again, these numbers are very important. That is the one thing they will look at first, okay? The total here is 50, say for instance, we had no non-cash, the total is 57, 59. Let's move over to the GC 400, is the starting um, balance, 57, 59. Perfect, they've passed the first test. Okay, that's the end of my section. I'm gonna, um, let Mr. Crandall sit down and he will move on and I will be back for the next part. Yeah, so we are trading places and having one seat as the uh, presentation uh, place and ignore the as you can tell, the names are reversed when we're sitting in the other chairs. Um, so the section I'm going to cover now is the accounting forms. They're judicial counsel forms. But uh, 
one comment I wanted to make about the inventory and appraisal that I don't believe was covered is in the section, I believe it's five uh, B, it talks about have you, if it's a decedent's estate, have you notified the county of the death? So when somebody passes away that owns real property, there's a form that gets filled out and filed with the county assessor's office, a uh, notice of death of real property owner. It's not recorded in the public documents, uh, but it does need to be filed. And um, later on, you may end up uh, preparing a parent-child exclusion to keep the property tax from going up, but um, that form is, is what they're referring to in line five. The other thing I wanted to tell you about was this exciting book, Fiduciary Handbook. Oh my gosh, it is so exciting. I haven't read it all, but it is an authority if you need to look up some details. It was written by Margaret Hand as one of the authors, and uh, Judge Green was another of the author, and Heather Hamilton was another author who has a fiduciary accounting service. And it is basically a reference. It won't teach you how to do the accounting, but if you're looking at one particular transaction, like what to do about stock options and puts and calls in a stock account, um, you can find the answer that you need. So I need to change here to my file called Appendix D from the Guardian Conservator book. So on this form, this is the pivotal form for the entire accounting. You come back to it all the time. And it's, uh, it's just the centerpiece, you'll see. And everything uh, flows to it and then you're done. So you fill out the masthead for guardian conservator. If you're working with a probate estate, you put that up there. If you're dealing with a trust, you put that on the top line. Um, it says summary of account, standard and simplified accounts. We're going to talk about standard accounts. I do not recommend using what they call simplified accounts. If you do, you can look it up on your own. Basically what that is, is instead of having everything broken out on a separate form per subject area, you go sequentially like a check register. And you can only have five pages total in your account to be able to, um, use that simplified account. And I don't recommend it. So this is your first, like your appraisal, inventory and appraisal, that's final. Because you only do it once when you're appointed, when you get your letters. Um, this is over a period of time. The, the inventory and appraisal is a snapshot in time of values. This is over a period of time. So when you get appointed and get your letters, you have to have within 90 days, turn in the inventory and appraisal. And on the regular accounting reports, you have to do the first accounting report within one year, the first year. And then every other year thereafter, you'll have to turn in the accounting reports. And the opening date of the account is the date of your appointment because they don't want to miss anything. And then it goes through the day before the next year um, to make it one year. And uh, there was a question about where to buy the book, uh, Fiduciary Accounting a Handbook. It is published by CEB, Continuation Education of the Bar in Oakland, and you can get that at their website. I believe there's a copy of it at the Contra Costa County Law Library. And it is available. I'm assuming it's available on Amazon. I don't recall where I got mine. 
Um, but that's that's where you get it. It's basically a CEB book. Okay, so I'm going to continue on with this GC400 sum. And um, there's two different numbers, GC400 sum and 405. Don't worry about it. They alternately numbered these things for some reason. But we're just using the 400 series, and, and it, it really doesn't matter. So the first thing, looking at this as an overview, are the big fonts there for charges and credits. To me, these words don't describe what you're doing. And it's kind of common in legal that you've got some obscure word that you have to use because someone in history had started it. To me, a charge is when you're using your credit card and you're getting debts. Excuse me, Brad? Um, yes? Form is not shared to the screen. The form is not shared to the screen. Okay, uh, let's see what, thank you for telling me that. Um, you know, I switched, yeah, great. I'm, I'm really glad you told me. So I will go and let's see if it's, let's try this. There we go. Is that, I needed to put it back on the screen. Okay, so I'm hopefully that's um, the GC400 sum. I really appreciate you telling me that because I would have been talking to myself for a long time. Okay, so we were talking about the terminology, charges and credits. To me, charge is when you use your credit card and you're gonna owe money. That's not what this is. Charges means money that came in to the guardianship, conservatorship, probate estate, or trust. So they should have said uh, income or cash flow or something. But the, um, the first two lines are just place markers that you obtain from your inventory and appraisal, the cash and the non-cash assets um, just are a copy job from the inventory and appraisal. One thing I wanted to mention on the inventory and appraisal is that when you um, make a list of assets, say you give them numbers, one, two, three, through 297, whatever the number system is, keep that number system throughout the entire accounting process because the probate examiners want to track assets and don't worry about it in the future if you sold asset number seven and the seven's missing. Um, don't change your asset numbers because it's it's equivalent to a name uh, in, in addition to the name. Okay, so the next word there is the um, credits. The credits, to me, somebody's giving you loans or something, I, or a, a bank is, or, or a, a department store is crediting your account so you don't owe anything. Okay, the theory behind the accounting is that you are a fiduciary, the highest responsibility under the law, and you are charged with the responsibility of taking care of the this money and these assets. If you don't take care of those assets, then you, not the estate, are personally liable. So it's also considered, um, another way of saying it is burden. It is a burden on you to take care of those assets. And that burden on you does not go away until the assets have been accounted for. And that is the other word here, the credits. So if it was cash flow, you would call it cash out or assets out. But in this case, they use the term credits. And the way the form is designed is that we have beginning inventory and appraisal. 
fine. We do one of them, never again. Then we have all the income coming in during the accounting period. And in this case, uh, 1.4 million and change. And then we're gonna list by categories, the expenses or disbursements. They're not actually expenses. Um, the disbursements, and then we come up with a new ending asset balance. And, and it's like another inventory and appraisal at the end of the accounting period, but you don't turn it in as a inventory and appraisal. It will just be a list of your ending assets, cash and non-cash. And then we have the um, total of assets on hand and then the total credits of 14,404 and change. So what the probate examiners do when they're gonna be evaluating your accounting before the judge gets it, is they're gonna take this line seven and the first thing they're gonna do and look at line 14. And it better balance or you're not done yet. And it seems ridiculous. I think they ought to get rid of pennies, but I, in income tax, we don't use pennies anymore. Everything is rounded to the nearest dollar. But um, the probate court, you have to balance everything to the penny. You know, when I was in accounting school, we went through and things didn't balance. It was two cents off. You go, hell with it. Just take two pennies on the page and move on. But uh, you can't do that here. It, it won't work. So balancing. Um, another point on these judicial council forms, um, the judicial, you got the California Supreme Court. Underneath the Supreme Court is a legislative or executive body, the judicial council. If you ever have a chance, their meetings are real interesting if you like court stuff and they're open to the public. And then the judicial council approves these forms for use, either mandatory or discretionary use. And in this case, it is approved for mandatory use. So every time you fire, file an accounting, it needs to have this page. And there are other ones that are discretionary. Um, and another point that they wanted to make in the filling out of the GC 400 sum is that if you have no transaction, put zeros in it because you're going to sign this under oath. And if you leave something blank, there is a bit of ambiguity whether you just didn't put it there or it was there or you forgot or whatever. So a zero is a statement that. Um, is binding on the accounting, and I, that's what's used. Okay, in terms of the uh, types of entities that, that are required on the Judicial Council form, it says here for probates, guardianships, and conservatorships. In addition, it's trusts who are getting their accounting approved. In the lower right of the form, are probate code sections. And what I call that for me is it's a breadcrumb trail. If you don't understand something on the form, you can go to the statute and read it. Now, my assistant Tamara says, heck with that noise, the people aren't gonna be reading that. And not only that, the code may be completely uh, written in a different language. That may be true, but I'm just pointing out that these code sections are available to you and they might be understandable um, to answer some questions. As far as I know, I am unaware of any form, a lot of IRS forms will have a sheet that say instructions. With judicial counsel, I haven't seen any. So you're on your own to try to interpret what the terms mean. Other than the statute. Okay, so GC 400, we're gonna be coming back to this all the time. As soon as we get done with another section, uh, we'll be back to it. Okay, so this is the second form and unfortunately this form is not in your materials. It's a GC 400 capital A C. 
this is a summary sheet for all the other detail schedules that you're going to be preparing. I just simplify the name of this form to Rex's favorite form because I like it and it makes sense to me. If you've got 27 different other pages supporting your transactions on multiple pages per kind of transaction, let's say interest income, this is the only place where those categories are assembled or totaled before you bring them back to the GC 400. So in Schedule A, for example, the GC 400 gives you one line on for, for Schedule A. So on the um, AC or my favorite form, it gives you all the details that you're actually working with. And the same thing for the disbursements totals for Schedule C, that one comes back forward here to line eight on the GC 400. I know this stuff is uh, rather dry and, and I want to keep it open for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, feel free to ask your questions. Okay. Um, so later on, we're going to cover the report and the petition. We'll get the camera back for that. But first off, we're going to start with the receipts. Whoa. As soon as I get the right form size. Okay, so you use your masthead. Um, in the office here, we use uh, essential forms, which is uh, Martin Dean, um, to fill out these forms. Um, and all of these forms are online so you can and they're fillable so you just go online do a search for the form number bring the form up on the screen don't fill it out on the screen save it to your hard drive before you start filling it out um, so the first schedule a is in this case for interest income and what the form requires is that you list every little transaction for interest income. All your transactions are per little or, or large transactions and you cannot summarize and say, okay, yeah, we had uh, about $1,400 of interest for that quarter, you can't do it. So you list the bank account and then go through the statement and post each of the items and not summarize. So when you get to the bottom of this page, you check the box. If you're gonna have multiple pages for schedule form A, page A, whoa, there we go, which we will. At the bottom of the form, you check the subtotal because it's not gonna include what's following and run your total for this page. Um, don't ever accumulate numbers from the bottom one page to the top of the next. Your numbers will be so far off, it will never balance. Another feature of this form is you use the um, section here for page, you know, Schedule A. This one is page two of six. So there are six Schedule A's. And although they call it one Schedule A, it ends up being divided into different sub uh, topic areas. And this one only has to do with interest. So because we have item two of six, we have, it's a subtotal. And when you get to the item six, as we'll show you, then you're done and it's the total of that page, but um, don't accumulate or, or use cumulative numbers. The, the next area, we have uh, pension income. So on the pension income, it's for pensions, annuities, and this particular one, uh, is for non-government uh, benefits. Um, 
So you list the uh, amount that was received frequently is from a bank account. Um, and you don't have to rename the, uh, the description for each account, uh, each transaction. That's not required. Um, I'm looking here and uh, trying to see if I skipped a page. So we have receipts of interest, receipts of dividends. Okay, so I there's dividends. I think I skipped that page, but it shows the Vanguard dividends listed each one from the statement. Then we go to receipts interest income, and then after that is the, the pension income. So you're keeping track of it by subject matter. Um, we have also created internally in the office spreadsheets for Excel that do the same thing as these forms do. Um, and it can be used for accumulating data over time. We, we have it available for $50, but it's, uh, and the probate examiners in the Contra Costa County are insistent on getting the GC 400 form for the summary, but sometimes they will allow a spreadsheet for the subschedules, but it still needs to be in this format, you know, schedule A, page three of six, and that type of format. So, oh, there's one point. I'm going to go back to dividends for a second because I wanted to make a point. And on the dividends, um, if you have a large stock portfolio and you have all these dividends coming in, they, they drive you nuts because there's just so many of them. And there's a procedure where people will reinvest their dividends and buy more shares and it creates a lot more bookkeeping because what you have to do is for each of those transactions first report the income then report the purchase then put the purchase on the asset list and it's called a dividend reinvestment program um, it is called a drip account because it reinvests and it'll drive you nuts. If you're in charge of the portfolio, stop the reinvestment of dividends into more securities and just leave it in cash until it accumulates, then invest it all at once. But the amount of, if you have a large portfolio, you could quadruple the amount of work you end up having to do with that um, drip accounting system and uh, you're putting the the cash value of the dividend there it's uh, not don't ever use per share value stockbrokers love per share values we don't use them here you just accept on the uh, inventory and appraisal okay so and the interest then we go to pensions um, one thing i wanted to point out here is I guess you would call it not a pet peeve, but <laughs> something like that. Um, and that is a six digit date. And what I mean by that is it gets me when I'm looking at reports and it just says, oh, April 5th, April 7th, August 32 or 31. Um, and I think kids learn that in school because they don't, the teachers don't care. And I think it's really a bad habit. Um, and it, it's essential on these to have the six digit date. Because I, I did an IRS audit one time with a gentleman in sales, and he brought in a big stack of entertainment receipts. All of them were four digit dates. So we were going back and forth with the auditor trying to determine which are in the current year in which you're not just avoid that whole thing and get into the habit of six digit dates um, another thing that i would recommend doing is as you're going through in your accounting as i mentioned you have to balance to the penny and that is 
every time you are doing a total, when I was in county school, we always had uh, adding machines and adding machine tape. They're not as common now, although I have one. Um, but the same concept applies if you're adding things up on a computer or your phone. What I mean by that is do your adding or whatever math you're doing and the total, but get into the habit of going back and checking your numbers before you use any total. And that's what the adding machine tape was. Every time we'd run a total, we'd look and see that we typed it correctly and verify it before we used it. It sounds like a nuisance to do. It's not. It's a great habit because when your accounting is off and you have spent four hours and you can't find where it is and it's just one little number that was added wrong, you'll realize the value of that concept. So on these uh, pensions, we're on schedule A3 of six. So we completed that one. And now we're on to rents, okay? So on the rents, I would, for rental properties, that's rental income, I would list them by property. So the next property we have is the next list. And sometimes we'll even put the um, tenant's name. If the tenant happens to be a relative of the uh, fiduciary, you definitely have to show that it's a relative because the court wants to know to try to avoid insider dealing and stuff. Um, and another point on the rentals is that if, if there's a, a bunch of rentals, say you had seven rental properties and you had all these transactions, you said, well, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to make a schedule A rent receipts and just show an Excel spreadsheet with columns all across the page. Don't do it. The court won't accept it. Unfortunately, the court hasn't caught up to what a spreadsheet is. And each one has to be in a separate form like this. And even though it makes more sense from an efficiency standpoint, it won't be acceptable. And in the description, say if there's a variety of kinds of rentals, one's a hundred unit apartment building, one's a cottage. Um, I would describe what kind of rental it is. One item that uh, is not included on rental income. And that is if you're running an Airbnb or if you have a bed and breakfast, or a hotel, it, has, it doesn't go on this rental form because an Airbnb and a bed and breakfast is a business. It's not just plain rent. So this means it's a passive uh, rental. And uh, there'd be other schedules that are used for, for businesses. Okay. Now we have social security income. Those uh, payments go automatically in the account. I don't think they accept uh, or allow people to get checks anymore. And what happens when you're doing a probate in the month of death, all of the social security received needs to go back to social security. Because on the day on the date of death, no matter if it was on the last day of the month, the Social Security is not paid in the month of death. Um, here we have a set of numbers. So the last one is from January to March. Um, this is a prohibited type of disclosure because it includes more than one transaction. You can't do this. You can't have three months at once. No, they're real anal. You've got to put every darn transaction that came in or it's not acceptable. And there's always a question when you're dealing with Social Security because um, oftentimes 
the check that's received is net after subtracting Medicare benefits. And what you list here is only what was received in cash. You don't include the total amount and then the Medicare payments somewhere else. Um, you include what your responsibility is, your uh, amount of cash that came in. You're not ha you don't have responsibility for the amount of the Medicare that's at the Treasury Department. They are responsible. But having said that, this transaction is net because the vendor or Social Security netted it before you received the funds. Now, changing subjects, there's another transaction that I recommend you never do, and it's also called netted transactions. So let's take an example like rents. So you have rental income is 2,500 a month, but the tenant said, you know, I'm going to rebuild the back porch for 500 bucks. You do not, in this example, you, if you netted the amounts, it's not proper. What you end up needing to do is show the total amount of rent as income, and then take the $500 barter and show that as a disbursement. Um, it was an accounting trick that contractors used to use where they would have bank loans and they'd have to have certain accounts zeroed out by the end of the year or not have certain transactions. So what they would do is net the positive numbers and the negative numbers so it always came out to zero. And it's not recommended. It, it, netting numbers is not something you would do in, in court accounting or, or actually any place else. Um, and another thing I wanted to point out is court accounting is not the same as fiduciary tax returns. A fiduciary tax return is required when a trust or a probate estate has over $600 of income for the year. And the rules for the tax reporting on IRS Form 1041 and California Form 541, the rules there are different from the required court accounting. The court accounting is mirroring the California Probate Code, and the tax returns are mirroring or applying the Internal Revenue Code, which is a completely different um, set of rules. It, it helps you get to the tax return, but it, the numbers are not exactly the same. So on this particular form, receipts other, this um, is for your miscellaneous items. So any unusual thing, state tax refund, court refund, different things, Medicare refund, just list the miscellaneous items and it's a subtotal, but now you'll see at the bottom of this that we're going to be leaving the Schedule A series of forms. And what that means um, is that we have a total to bring forward. So we're done with Schedule A, the income items. And, and so what I do next is I go to the, uh, what I call my favorite form. Oh, where'd it go? I'll have to bring it back here. Uh, I click something. Let's see if this does it. Is it back? Doesn't look like it. Um, Well, <laughs> I, I these uh, there we go. Uh, appendix 
inventory and appraisal. Close, but no cigar. Excuse me why I get my screen to match what you're doing, what we're doing. Okay. Inventory and appraisal, I don't want. This is what I do want. Is uh, is my are you seeing my screen on the summary sheet? Yeah. Can, some, can someone answer that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So I got it corrected. Anyway, I was wildly clicking and went off, fell off the train. So we were just talking about we were done with the A series six of six. So what I do at this point is I subtotal under the categories on this summary form because we're completely done with the Schedule A items and you, you would put your total on the interim sheet before you brought for Schedule A. Now we're back to the GC 400 sum and that's the total of all of your Schedule A items and you have to look at this like a computer website link in other words when the probate examiners are going to make sure that everything funnels back to this total so you have to make sure that every work paper in the in your disclosures always gets total and brought forward otherwise you're not done yet. So we've completed the uh, A series. So I want to move on to gains. It's still income. In this case, we have a sale of a residence. As you can see, it was sale of a house in Palm Springs. The carry value We've got that from the inventory and appraisal. The probate referee gave us this number and that carry value will be on your books until that property is sold. And in this case, it was sold for 250,000. So the difference here, obviously it's 19,000 and that's the um, required um, uh required transaction or number and it says that it's nineteen hundred dollars of, of profit well i disagree with that if you have a house that you bought let's say you bought it at 230 and you sold it at 250,000, your gain is not going to be nineteen thousand. i absolutely guarantee it you're going to have closing costs you're going to have real estate broker fees you're going to have uh, prorations, a lot of different things, but this is how you have to report it, showing it as a gain. And the other items that are disbursements out of the um, escrow are going to be entered later, not on this form. And uh, when you're dealing with escrows, it, a lot of people doing it, court accounting, are unsettled by the fact that you never ever use the cash amount that the seller received the net check it's it just isn't posted anywhere all the other transactions in the escrow are um, included okay so we did a house sale and we'll come back to the expenses okay so now we start in disbursements. In this case, we have a convalescent home. And uh, we have one client that was paying $150,000 a year in rent and care. Wow, it's amazing. And just list the check number, the amount, and the date that it was paid. Frequently, the care facilities will give you a um, statement at the end of the year. and. Um, if the person's not capable of caring for themselves, we always, on when we do the fiduciary tax returns, we always end up deducting this amount as a medical expense. But for now, we're just going to leave it and it's 
at page C, one of eight. Then we go into the general expenses of administering the guardianship, conservatorship, or estate. And these are items that would not have occurred if there was no guardianship, probate, estate, or, or conservatorship. So you list the reimbursements to the, in this case, uh, the conservator. The attorneys had court costs, their reimbursements, and the probate referee is getting paid for the appraisals. And American indemnity for fire insurance. You'll notice on these transactions, they say reimbursement for the conservator, reimbursement for the attorney. When you're doing court accounting, you cannot make the disbursements to the guardian, conservator, or trustee, uh, uh, executor, unless it's approved by the court. But you are allowed to get reimbursements as long as you turn in a receipt and can justify that the disbursement um, benefited the, um, the conservator's estate. I uh, had went over and talked to the probate examiners, uh, Erica and uh, Susan Long, Contra Costa County earlier this year, and I wanted to find out what their view was on the most common errors, <laughs> the most common errors in doing court accounting. And they were happy to share what their, um, th they found. Um, and one of them I verified the GC 400 sum is required. The other schedules sometimes can be done on Excel or QuickBooks, as long as they're right in format. And, one of the most common problems the examiners get is the GC 400 income and disbursements ending, you know, don't balance, beginning and ending don't balance. Or another way is you end up closing out one year and then you start the next year accounting and you haven't carried the exact number forward for whatever reason. Another item that they think is important for getting your accounting accepted. And that is the expenses need to be clearly labeled. So East Bay Mud or PG&E or whatever the expense is, which would be the vendor name. But you also have to give the probate examiners something that would let them know it was for the benefit of the ward or the, the probate estate. So for example, if you have a conservatorship and you put in a hot tub, you know, the court's going to wonder if that's for the benefit of the conservator or not. And so what you would do is either in a footnote or in the line describing it, you would say, the hot tub benefits the ward because of a medical condition that would be helped by the hot tub and doctor approved. Another example of something that would get challenged if not properly um, explained how it benefits the, um, the ward, and say you bought 20 sets of bed sheets. Well, well, just saying that alone, the probate examiners might think that you're buying them for your own use or you're selling them at the flea market. But if you put a disclosure in that the ward was incontinent and they had to change the sheets frequently, then that's the context of why that would be a, a reasonable item to pay for. Okay, expenses, living expenses. These would be personal items, cable, cell phone, different things, incidental costs for the conservatorship. You just list what they are 
And in this case, we're using the uh, fiduciary checkbook because we have the checkbook column. And um, frequently they're listed in sequential order. And it's quite simple. It's just listing all the costs that you would attribute for living. And, and I would not put major things like uh, mortgage payments and things like that. I have and a few examples to add. Sorry, I just came back. Um, so I'm going to add a few things. Um, also, items that are good to list here would be like groceries. Going back, the switch screens. Groceries, any type of clothing. Um, I like here to where you would list a hairdresser or getting their haircuts. Um, here would be a good place for pedicures, massages, um, anything. Pedicures like, for the ward, not the yeah, not the conservator. Okay, I'm just clarifying. Um, but again. Uh, just because you have to account for some expenses for them does not mean that um, you stop their regular things that they are, you know, they've been able to do. Um, like if they love going to get their hair done once a week, whether you think they need the haircut or not, that's it's not your question. If that's what makes them happy and they are used to getting their hair cut every week, then by all means, let them get their darn hair cut. Maybe not now because of our COVID problems, but once we, you know, get back into things, please don't stop um, their regular living because you're worried you have to do accounting or you have to explain for it. Um, again, if it's part of their normal everyday life and they've done it so many years, um, your job is not to come in and take that away from them. Your job is to let them continue um, their normal ways um, for as long as they can. It makes them happy. It gives them reason, believe it or not, to smile. I have an elderly father. And I will just tell you recently, because of COVID though, I've taken away, um, I do the grocery shopping for him now. And he said to me the other day, oh my God, that's the only time I was able to get out of the house. Now you're gonna, now you're taking that away from me and now I'm stuck at home and I can't go anywhere. I, I had to explain it was for his protection because of the COVID and stuff like that. But, He's already looking for, okay, when this is over, I can do my own grocery shopping again, right? And, you know, so let them continue to do the things really that make them happy and don't you want to take do that away. Dogs, cats, and horses. Um, the only, uh, that's, that's in a different piece. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. you. Go ahead. You can go. So I'll let him go back. Sorry, I just wanted to add those things for your examples. Okay. Um, just wanted to mention that when you're in charge of a guardianship conservatorship and the person's uh, incapacitated, um, assuming they're not going to recover in the future, um, you might need to get change things around rather quickly. Uh, for example, if the person had a horse and now they're incapacitated and they're never going to ride the horse again, um, the suggestion would be to sell the horse right away to keep the cost from accumulating. But that's not the exception. And um, so that it, it simplifies the transaction, it's going to have to be done anyway. Um, on the other hand, if you have pets like a love dog or cat, um, and just because you don't like it doesn't mean that it isn't of emotional value for the ward. So those you would end up, you know, paying the cost for because they're part of the living expenses. Okay, so we have medical expenses, list those um, sequentially and 
in the, the form there, we have check numbers. And I was looking at this first one, it says 010T. And I couldn't figure out what check number that would be. And I ended up concluding that that was a temporary check when the guardian or conservator just opened up their new account. So that might account for why it, it looks unusual. Um, okay, so right now for expenses, we're still on the schedule uh, C's, but we're on four of eight and we still have a subtotal. Now we're getting into the property. Move this over a little bit. No, a lot of stuff on the screen with this zoom. Um, okay. I see a question. All right. So now we're looking at the GC four hundred page C nine in the upper right, and we're showing the cost to sell the house in um, Palm Springs. So this is where all the expenses are coming out that I mentioned further earlier. And these normally would be the non-recurring closing costs from the escrow final closing statement. Oh, and make sure you get the final closing statement because we have clients on property sales come in and they give me a, a preliminary or tentative um, escrow. And you have to get the final because it may change quite a bit before the escrow is completed. So non-recurring closing costs are things that happened because the property was sold. Brokers commissions, lender fees, things like that, they would go here. Other items that would be considered non-recurring closing costs would be like property expense for interest, uh, insurance payments, things of that nature that recur year after year. And then those items you would transfer to the appropriate schedule because those happened um, regardless of whether the house was sold or not. And the next item here is we, we paid off a bank loan. You just took off my panel. You just killed my whole screen one. Okay. okay, yes. Okay, so I got my power back. I had lost it for a second. All right. So this particular item is the words property was sold off. We had a consignment company and the furniture was sold and the consignment company charged a fee. They're showing all the income and this is 20% of the sales price that we are paying for their services. Um, and the, the income would be reported on the income transactions. This were on the disbursements at the moment. Rental property expenses. Now, me being a tax person, I just don't like this at all. I'm so used to rental expenses by categories, you know, gardening, uh, repairs, plumbing, depreciation, that the sequential thing doesn't look right to me, but it's required. So on the rental property, I would list them sequentially for each property and list the transactions. So we've got a loan payment. You'll notice we're not breaking out principal and interest at this point, just the payment itself, which includes um, principal interest. It might include taxes and insurance, but we're just doing the money out. Uh, property tax is paid ahead. Um, and then the rest of the loan payment. So we're on C7 of 8. So move on to the next one. We have this disbursements other. This is another one of the miscellaneous 
forms, this one for disbursements, and anything else you couldn't fit in another one of the categories listed here. Um, we had one gentleman in one time that was in our classes, and he was extremely worried about making a mistake or not following the rules. I don't think there's any need for that. Just do the best you can and put the numbers honestly where you think the categories should be. If it turns out you didn't use the proper category, the judge is not going to shoot you on the spot. Um, the probate examiners, if it's that large of a thing, they might ask you to change it before they accept the county. But just do your best efforts um, when you're going through this process. Okay, so now with this general disbursements, we are uh, eight of eight. We're out of the C schedules. Okay, so, sorry, I'm going to add a few more things under the miscellaneous expenses. Just to give you guys an idea um, of other expenses that I myself would put here. Um, a lot of times that um, you might be able to, or some people have done, was ask the court to approve an allowance for um, the person, especially if you're talking a, a minor who might be 16 or 17 and you wish to give that minor like, I don't know, $80 a week or you know, just a little bit of spending money because you do allow him to go out every once in a while with friends or you know, Slurpee or whatever they wish. So. In that case, here is where you would put any court approved allowances that you've asked for. Some other ideas of expenses would be household repairs. So if um, refrigerator needed repair, the heater, the air conditioner, um, anything, any, you know, any microwave, um, car repair, you know, anything that needs repair, you could put repairs there. Another thing to really use this section for would be recreation and leisure. So, and again, we're in COVID, so this changes a little bit, but say they liked going to the movies or every once in a while you wanted to take them. And I think I would use your kind of judgment, but say they go to the casino once a week with, or bingo. Um, with our friends and that's a recreation so you would put the totals there some say out to dinner um but the only thing about the whole dinner thing is be careful that when you're going out to dinner i think it's eric but oh, maybe i'll come back to that later is um you split the cost so really the expenses should only be um the conservatees, but I know another thing which I don't find anything wrong with it, and I think it's kind of cute. Is I think Eric, I'm going to use you as an example, okay? But sure, I go think ahead. <laughs> that you won't hurt a bit. I know that sometimes, okay. So one dinner, you know, see, they go out once or twice a week um, for him, you know, and his partner. So one time he pays, the next time. Um, the conservative pays and then the next so they swap back and forth um on who pays actually for dinner and it makes the conservative feel like you know yes he's contributing and he's getting to pay for dinner that night it kind of does make them feel good like you know they're contributing so that's a good place to put on this form the other thing, um, so moving on would be. Tamara, can I add a quick comment to your point? Yes, son. So the court investigator, um, in my case, and it might apply to other people, said the other option that a conservator has uh, is give the conservatee a, for example, a Cheesecake Factory gift card. And you can account for them paying 
um, the person and their family they want to pay for by using that oh, nice. restaurant gift card rather than creating a bill where it's an expense and in that expense the conservatee has paid for his or her meal plus the meal for someone else so the gift card was just an idea the court investigator provided to me in my telephone interview with her that's awesome thank you thank you for sharing that's very cool so that's a great idea i will add that to my um example Okay, so the other thing, um, other maybe expenses um, would be um, bank charges. I know um, most banks, if not all banks, charge a fee monthly um, to keep the money in the bank. So this is where you would put those charges. Um, the other, um, a few more example would be postage if you pay for postage because mom likes writing thank you cards and christmas cards and birthday cards and sending all that out so postage would go here the other thing that would go here which rex mentioned earlier um about would be pet expenses so say for instance every once in a while you take the dog to a groomer or um their food or maybe a little toy or anything like that those are some more examples to put on that miscellaneous um section okay so you're done with the miscellaneous okay so what do we have here okay so the next item that we're talking about on Schedule D, it ends up being uh, Schedule D, page one of one, has to do with losses on sales. So in this case, we're getting rid of the jalopy car. We had a carry value of thirty-one twenty-five from the probate referee. We sold it for three thousand. So now we have a loss that needs to be accounted for. And um, I wanted to point out something that I noticed recently is I was telling you in the beginning that you don't change your asset numbers ever when you're doing the accounting from the time you initially set them up on your inventory and appraisal. And if you'll notice in the parentheses on this transaction, it says INA inventory and appraisal. It is attachment two, and they're giving you the asset number, number seven. So that lets everybody know that number seven's gone and um, it's been identified and the probate examiners, I believe, um, look for things like that on, on transactions for sales of assets. So, at this point, you're seeing cash on hand at the end of the period. So before we get to that, well, you're out of the expense group in our examples here. And now what we're entering into is more like the inventory and appraisal. It's as of a specific date and time, the end of the accounting period, and you list the balances on this transaction uh, sheet or asset sheet. And uh, when you're turning in the bank statements with your accounting, you want to make sure you include the bank statement for the period just before you started and were appointed and then after, just so that the court examiners can tie it in from, uh, because some of the most likely when you became appointed and got your letters, the bank did not do a new statement. So you'd have to give them the statement from before the time you were appointed. Okay, so we, those are the cash and here's the non-cash assets. There again, you wanna reconcile it with your inventory and appraisal. Listing the assets and in this example, they. They um, are also showing 
the item number. In other words, the asset number. And I think that's a, a good way to tie things together. So the most important thing for your court accounting is the carry value because that's going to be used. The other aspect that is less important from getting your accounting approved is the estimated market value. That does not mean you get a new probate referee. It's your guesstimate of value. And one good thing about having this section, let's say you're uh, a fiduciary and there's a large portfolio of securities. Well, what you would want to do is have an investment um, statement, your investment policy, and make that available to all uh, interested parties and then um, the reason for it is maybe your investment policy didn't work out too well and by putting in showing that the investments let's say dropped for this um, year and when the accounting is approved by the court then any beneficiary would not be able to sue on the accounting because it had already been approved by the court and they had the right to object. And uh, on this one, the ending inventory, we talked a bit about diamonds before. Um, I'm not sure I would call it a diamond. I'm not sharp enough to know what's a diamond and what's not. What's a cubic zirconian looks pretty good to me. So I, I might not go and assert unless there's a some kind of uh, jeweler's appraisal or something like that. I would just call it a wedding ring. Okay. So at this point, we've listed all the expenses and we have to go back to the GC 400 to tie everything out. So we've done the total of the six pages of schedule A Schedule B from Rex's favorite schedule. We use the summary to accumulate. And uh, it, it says not to turn in with your accounting. I don't think the probate examiners are going to shoot you if you do. Um, I like the form for tracing numbers. Um, list all the gains for the period. So you've got your total. The disbursements. We just go through the total of all the Schedule C, all the Schedule Ds. And you'll notice here, there is some flexibility in the way the form is designed to actually make your own form names, okay, or letters. Um, I would suggest when you're adding new forms, you have to put a letter or a number here. I would suggest you use numbers to tie your, um, your added schedules. And the reason why is when I was looking at this form and I said, okay, D, the next one I'm gonna add is E. Now there's already an E, so it th would throw it off. So that's my suggestion is use numbers. This is from the summary sheet we just looked at, ending cash and non-cash at carry value. And then we total out the property and then add up the whole columns and our 1.404 million and 1.404 million balances. So at that point, for if you had gone through the entire year, um, you'd be done with that accounting. And on this accounting, it says first account. Um, there's some suggestions in this area. And that is, if you're taking over the guardianship of someone else, or conservatorship, or probate, and they've already turned in accountings, you might want to uh, put like Julie's first accounting instead of just continuing on with the others, because then it would show when the uh, fiduciary changed. Okay, so Tamara, do you want to? take the uh, report and petition? I do, I do. I can stay here. Oh, uh, well, I think I've got to count on you too. Here's the, uh, I've got the report. 
up on the screen. So now we're going to cover the uh, cover sheet or report and petition that will accompany your accounting when it's submitted to the court. I think you can click on a page and move it that way. So hello all, I'm back. Well, I wanted to actually, let's take a minute and make sure that there are no questions or there's nothing um, that you still have questions on on the last part, uh, the GC400, before we move to the petition. Is everybody good? Okay, I'm Is gonna- Is anybody awake? I know it. <laughs> Is, we, uh, Is everybody asleep now? This is Gwendolyn. I had a question. Go for my, it. And my question is, where do I buy the Excel spread? Um, you could just contact our office. Just send us an email. Okay, because I figure I want to do both so I can see which one would, you know, benefit me the most. What's right? Sure. You know? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the petition, which is what you're seeing on screen here. I'll slide up a little bit. The petition, what, um, what is the purpose? And, uh, now that you've done all these forms, we have the first one, which is the inventory and appraisal, which is telling the courts, um, this is my start date, how much cash and non-cash I have. And then we go into the um, accounting for the year, which shows uh, your honor, this is how much income came in, how much expenses went out, and um, so that they know that there's nothing um, and or if they believe there are expenses or things happening, um, they use that time to determine whether they wish you to continue your um, conservatorship or not. Um, and that would be pretty extreme though. Please don't let me scare you. Um, that's just for um, individuals. I don't think those individuals are taking this class, but it's for individuals who may not use their best judgment in paying expenses. So now you're ready to submit the accounting to the court. And so basically the a petition or what you're gonna complete next, um, what is its purpose? What it is, is it's actually a summary to the judge um, stating, okay, this is all that's happened. We'll see that as we go through. And then what do you want him to do with it? Do you want him to throw it away? Do you want him to look at it? to approve it, um, things of that nature. So that's what basically what this next section is for. Um, and this cannot, and it's extremely important because they've seen it time and time again, it cannot be handwritten and it must be on pleading paper. See, this is what they call pleading paper, the numbers along the side here. So, they have online plenty of um, blank pleading paper form um, so that you can complete this. So somehow, some way, you have to figure out how to complete this on a computer, a typewriter, or um, something like that, because it cannot be template. handwritten. Okay. Um, so basically you're going to start with and again this is an example as if prepared by an attorney instead of the jared roberts and um, his state bar number you would put your first and last name and then comma <coughs> conservator guardian um whatever executor ad, special administrator whatever your title is you will provide your address, your city, state, your phone number, and your email address. It's almost like the very um, inventory and appraisal, same header. 
and instead of attorney for, you would just put um, a pro per. Again, the same as the inventory and appraisal header. You would put Superior Court of California, County of Contra Costa. Over on this side, it's conservatorship of the person and the estate. Please make sure you just don't use those words. You must have been given letters of both person and the estate or you might just be conservator of the estate, which means their money, or you might just be a conservator of the person. So it can be one or the other or both. Okay, then you'll put the name of the person receiving the care. And it's really important if they do go by another name, like legally their name is Elizabeth, but they always go by their middle name, which is Susie. You can put that there. On the right hand side is the case number. And you're stating it could be your first account, it could be your second account, it could be your 10th account, it can be whatever account it is. But don't put first if it's really your second or third. Um, this is example of just your first accounting you're turning in. So it's first account, current in the report of the conservator, and a petition for its settlement, the approval, you're telling the judge um, that you sold property and you want his blessing, you are asking, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm just using his mouse and his sliding. Um, you're a last asking for allowance for your fees to be paid if you so choose. If there is an option on whether you choose to um, pay yourself or not. And then if there is an attorney involved, here is where you ask for his compensation. It is extremely important you do not pay yourself any amount, any amount until you're, you've received approval. You will indicate here the date of your hearing, the time, the department, and if you know the um, judge who is overseeing the case, if it's not known, um, because you could be bounced between two or whatever, you can leave that blank. Everybody good? Yep. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna move down to what it actually says or what you are asking um, the court, the judge to do. So basically you're saying, your honor, me, I, the petitioner, so it would be, I, you are the petitioner, so you, the petitioner, your name, As the conservator, we're using that example, so it might be, you know, you would change it based on your situation of the state, of the person that's listed up here, who is the conservatee, presents this accounting for settlement and allowance. I wish you to verify what I've done and all the acts I've done. And so here is a summary for you so you don't have to try and figure out the whole case. You can just read my summary and then you know ahead of time everything and what you're going to look for on the accounting. So the first thing you will list is your appointment. So basically you're saying the petitioner, me, was appointed a conservator of the person and of the state of the conservatee. Here it states she's known as something else, and the date, and letters of conservatorship were issued on this date. At all times since my appointment, I, that's you, have been acting as the conservator. 
So you state my inventory and appraisal was returned. Now, if you never sent it to a probate referee, you won't say was returned, but you would just say was filed. So what date you filed it with the court and it showed a value of the estate and that's the total value that's on the bottom line. So that's the total of the cash assets and the non-cash assets. So you're telling them what the total was. Then we're gonna go to page two. Oop. You're gonna tell the judge Okay, the account covers this time frame to this time frame. So he'll verify. You're going to tell him charges and credits. The conservator is chargeable and is entitled to the credits respectively and you would indicate the information here. Your fifth item. Okay, so one thing that's really important um, is some of these items that I'm gonna list on here, you may not necessarily have. If you don't have them, some of, most of them, you just would not include. So my number five, which talks about investments, if you don't have any investments, you will go down to statement of liabilities or you will go down to a sale. You won't list authorized investments and then leave that paragraph blank. So only include what would apply to your case. But in this case, we had authorized investments. So all I'm telling the judge is during the time period, all cash, has it been invested and maintained? And this is extremely important in interest bearing accounts. I will give you an example we've had long, long ago, but we had, um, or we've known a case where the um, conservator did not put the money in an interest bearing account. It was just a regular checking account, which you know never earns more than a penny or five cents. What happened is after years and years of continuing on and just keeping the money in um, those accounts, um, one of the beneficiaries, which I think was a sister or a daughter, sued the conservator for the interest that the money would have gained if the conservator would have put it in an interest bearing account. And that conservator was liable and did have to pay whatever interest was lost because they did not put the money in an interest bearing account. So just be careful of um, that part. If you don't have it in now, the sooner you move it and take care of all that, the better off you are. But don't go running out and then adding your own personal money to the account to add interest just in case. That's not necessary. Just continue on, but do it the right way from now on. Okay, the next one is statement of liabilities. You would state um, whether there's any liens, whether taxes, are paid or not, um, whether there's any outstanding judgments. Typically, you know, um, you wouldn't have much to say here because you're gonna take care of everything for them. But say for instance, you came into a situation where you found that your conservator owed back taxes of 10 years um, and you think, oh my God, what a mess. You must indicate that here. You must indicate that you found prior to your appointment that the conservator owed back taxes, or that you could also state if you find out, which we get many on a regular basis, that the conservator never filed income taxes. 
And so they, they haven't filed income taxes for five years. Well, you don't know if they owe and you don't know if they're going to get a refund, but you're going to state here that you're going to do everything you can to catch those up, file them, and you may have a liability later on. You don't know, you know, state what you're doing ahead of time and put it out there that you're going to do what you can to correct it because it must be corrected. That's your responsibility now, even though it was something that should have been done prior to your appointment. Okay, so the next item would be um, that, remember in the GC400, Rex went through the sale of the automobile. So this is telling the judge what you did. So you're telling him, okay, I sold an automobile, it was on the inventory and appraisal initially, but then when I sold it, I sold it as a loss because nobody wanted it. It was an ugly pink color. Okay, so you're telling, um, you're being upfront with the judge that you tried your best to get the most you could for the vehicle, but just nobody wanted this pink car. Um, so you still had to sell it and um, you took a loss. Now the next thing would be the sale of furniture and furnishings. So remember back in your inventory and appraisal where you um, there was a sale of a vacation home. So basically you can't just throw away all the furniture that was in that vacation home. And nowadays, believe it or not, um, some people include the furniture in the sale of the property. That could be the case, but you need to state it because it's no longer an asset that you're in control of. Instead of five years later and somebody goes, oh my gosh, you know, a beneficiary, where's all that furniture that was in that vacation home? And then you have to try and explain or they file um, something in court against you saying, oh my God, she stole all that furniture. She's using it in her backyard and blah, blah, blah. No, you're stating up front that either you sold it off differently than the house sale or as part of the house sale. So basically you're saying you sold the furniture at, that was at the Newport Beach or the Newport Beach home. The inventory and appraisal listed it as this item. And then why you sold it? Well, because it was rented or they didn't need it or they didn't want it and your the house the conservatee is in is fully furnished so you don't need it anymore okay so then you will state the items were sold um the property and then this is important the property was appraised by the appraiser remember they're the ones that give value to non-cash um 2,500 less the dealer. So in this case, they had like an auction house sell the furniture. And so they had to pay a commission on it. You must state if that's what you do. Otherwise, you would not have all that information in there. Okay, now we're going to go to the sale of real property. This is, remember, we sold the vacation house. Um, but you're going to say, you're going to tell the judge, you're putting it out in this order. I, the conservator, sold the vacation home, whether it was for a gain or a loss. And the, you had a court order confirming the sale and what date you filed it. Now, see where it says additional bond. Why would it say that you did an inventory and appraisal and your bond was for enough cash, right? Well, we got to consider, see this house? It's no longer a house. What is it? It's cash. 
Up top, see the furniture you sold? It's no longer non-cash. It's cash. See the automobile you sold? That's also now become cash. So your 57,000 in cash that you started off with when you did the inventory and appraisal now is $257,000 in cash that you have or that you've put in the uh, accounts for the conservative. So would your bond of 57,000 be sufficient at this point? No, correct. So here you will state at the time we sold the vacation home and it was confirmed, we had a bond, whatever amount, but now we've sold the house and we've received all this extra cash. And you're going to tell the judge whether the bond is still sufficient or not. In some cases, it may be. In this case, where you had a sale, you would probably state it's insufficient and you'd have to increase your bond amount. Because again, the bond is to protect cash because cash can walk away. Typically, a house cannot walk away. Somebody will find it and be able to get it back or something like that. But try getting cash back from anybody. It won't happen. Once that cash hits pockets, I can tell you my own. It's usually a Starbucks or somebody where else. The cash is now gone. So it's to prevent cash from walking away. Okay, so now another very, very important. I can't stress enough how important this next statement is, which is number 11. You must indicate whether you have hired for repairs, to cut hair, any but any to do any job that you paid for, if the person was a family member or an affiliation to you. So let's say I hired me, the conservator, hired my son to mow the lawn once a week. And I paid my son 50 bucks um, a week. I would indicate here that during the time period, I did hire my son to mow the lawn for the conservative. What has happened in the past, and the reason why this is so important, is it has appeared in the past that a conservator will hire one of their own personal family members and say, for instance, all of a sudden, instead of paying my son $50 a week to mow the lawn, I start paying him $150 a week because he's my son. And he needs the money for college and to buy books. Do you think it's justified that just because he wanted $150 to mow the lawn that I am able to hire him to do that? No, I am not. If he is not willing or cannot take the same fee that a regular everyday other person who is not related to me would take, then you have no rights to hire them. Plus, it will be scrutinized a whole lot more. Like, for instance, if I recorded in here, yes, I paid my son, the, I'm the conservative, a tour, and I paid my son to mow the lawn. I can almost guarantee you, without verifying this, that the judge goes back and sees how much I paid my son and that I've indicated his name and how much he's actually gotten. So say for instance, let me use one more example. Say for instance, the lawn used to be mowed only once a week, but 
I want my son to make a little bit of extra money or he needs a little bit of extra money. Or my son has said to me, ah, oh, you know what? Really the lawn needs mowed twice a week. I have, I didn't verify it. And really a lawn does not need mowed more than once a week, but um, he says it. So I go ahead and say, okay, I'll do it twice a week. And so the 50 turns to a hundred a week. The judge will probably look at that and say, um, no, you're just trying to, um, let's say, give income to your son. He needs to go earn it somewhere else. So just be very careful that if the person is related to the conservatee or to you as the conservator, that one, they get the proper um, fees paid nothing more can be less but nothing more than the average any other person would charge and two you have indicated that you did pay a family member okay any questions there because that's really an important section right there and i can't see if any questions come in so i'm gonna leave that right okay perfect Okay, let's move on. We're getting down to compensation. Now, this is my favorite part. Am I going to get paid for all of this crazy, wild work that I'm doing um, on this accounting as the conservator? Yes, you can get paid for it. And there is local court rules. Um, I think that there is local court rules which he probably doesn't have this page up for you to see but it's on a pink sheet but there are local court rules that state the amount of fees that you can collect um as a conservator for all this work you did um preparing the accounting if you if a, a fiduciary or a paid um a professional can be um i know there's a might be it's right there on the floor um a paid professional and i'm just going to show you so i'm going to put it in front of the camera for you um it is local court rule 7.450 Okay, that you can look that up if you need to, but I'm gonna put it in front of you just to show you real quick. Uh, we lost power. Sorry, uh, uh, it's back. Okay, so I'm gonna put it now in front of the screen and tell me if you can, um, I know it's a little bit hard to read because it's pink, but it'll tell you like, the amount an attorney can charge if you hire an attorney it tells you a fiduciary rate if you're not a non-fiduciary non i'm sorry non-professional i'm reading it backwards um travel time it even gives um something for travel time where can we get that from? Et cetera. Typically, for the non-professional um, fiduciary, the rate is 50 an hour. And then for the travel time, um, basically that travel time is meaning for an attorney. Just FYI. And again, you can look up those local court rules, which would state compensation. But okay, let's go back down. So the um, conservator's compensation. So say I am completing this, or you've hired a professional to complete this. You would say, whoever it was that completed all the, well, there could be two um, just keep that in mind because if you paid a fiduciary to complete the accounting 
but you also want to be paid for all the other stuff that you've done um, through the year. It would, it would be in two different sections. Don't mix them, okay? So your fee, so we're going to use this example. So the conservator has spent over 150 hours providing services to the conservatee who is his mother. Again, this is written by the attorney. So in your case, or most case, it, it would be who is my mother. Anyway, the conservator has visited the care facility. So give a brief um, description of what actually you've done. So this says the conservator has visited the care facility where the conservatee lives at least once a week I've made sure that she's receiving the proper care. So one of the things that could be part of your job is to look to see that her bed sheets are clean or there's no bruises on, and I'm not saying do a full physical exam, but make sure there's not any bruises. Ask her how she feels. Um, ask her, you know, is there anything that she'd like to tell you that maybe happened during the last, from the time you haven't seen her again. And just keep that um, mental note. So not so you could only say it here to the judge so he knows you're properly caring for um, her, but also for just your own sanitary, I mean, you know, so you feel safe that she's there every day. Okay, so you've received, you've verified she's receiving proper care and that all her personal needs are met. That means she's been bathed, um, she still has the same kind of weight, so you know she's eating. She's telling you last week they brought in cake for somebody's birthday, so you know she's happy. Maybe she gained a pound or two because she's doing less walking or whatever. Just state all of that. It, it's great to just put it, but don't be like pages and pages because the judge doesn't want to read that. Be pretty um, pretty short with their, whatever you say. Anyway, you're stating I have marshaled all of the assets. I've paid all the bills on time. And I've managed the estate. I've arranged for the sale of the automobile because she can't drive. I've listed the house. I've raised money for her care. I've rented out her other house, so now there's monthly income. And up to this point, I have received no compensation for these services. So in this case, the conservator requests $500. Well, I think that's a whole lot of gosh darn work for $500, but that's what they're asking for in this case, which they state they believe is a reasonable amount to be compensated. So, so. more than I can tell you the judge would approve that <laughs> uh, because it's really not much they're asking for, for a whole year. That's 500 for a year, not for a month or anything like that. That would be something um, else. Now, in this case, they did have an attorney, so this is where this is here. But if you were completing it for yourself, you would not have this section here. Um, but you could say the fiduciary who helped you complete the accounting or something, what their compensation would be. So I'm going to just read through this quickly to show you the example. The conservator retain the services of an attorney to help advise on what they were doing or to do the accounting. Um, you state no payments have been made to this attorney. Um, that um, the attorney has provided a declaration describing all of his services and he is requesting for his time $3,500 as reasonable compensation for his services. So again, you're asking the judge, I'd like to pay the attorney because you have not paid um, anybody 
in the past. Okay, so another thing is the veteran benefits. I know we have somebody on here who talked about the veteran benefits and um, things like that. So in this case, this person is not receiving any money um, from veterans. But if they are, please change that and indicate. Okay, so a state hospital. Again, do not put these in if they do not apply. So the state hospital. Eh, I'm so sorry. His mouse goes from one extreme to the other. It either goes to the top of the page or the bottom of the page. Nowhere in between. Okay. So during um, this conservatorship, you state the conservatee has not been a patient at a state hospital, whether they have or haven't. What's nice to know is you put in here, where is the conservatee at? Where do they live? Are they at home? Are they at your house? Are they at a care facility? Are they roaming the streets? Um, where are they? Um, that part is really important so that the judge, if they wanted to, just knows where the person lives. So on number 17, um, the account statement, we can stick that at the end. Anyway, in the account statement, um, here is the part where I know Leslie asked earlier, but um, so it says submitted to the court, but not attached to this document, but I still submitted the original account statements from the banks showing the balance of all accounts where the money of the estate is or was deposited from the period immediately preceding the date of my appointment and the period ending after the date that I've stopped my accounting. Again, you'll see down here where it says the original bank statements um, are public record. Now, one thing that's very important, and I will tell everybody here, to keep in mind, when you are submitting bank statements with your accounting, everything is public information. So I myself, could go down to the recorder and pull this file, which includes all the bank statements and know absolutely the account number, where it's located. I can figure out the routing number by just going online and typing Wells Fargo Bank and it'll already come up with a routing number. And I can do so much damage. So what we like to state is for bank records that you do what's called a redact, which means black out the first part of the account number and only show maybe the last four digits. You're only showing the judge that the bank statement is really the bank statement of your conservatee, no other purpose. So you do not submit to the court bank statements which show um, um, the bank account number. If you also want, because anybody else can um, get this information, is if those bank statements go to your house or go, um, you can redact that information also. You just cannot redact or cross out any um, of the income or expenses. So the coming in or going out. Because then the judge wants to know 
what are you hiding? Because if you're crossing out an expense, he wants to know why you're crossing it out. So again, it's public information. Anybody can go pull the records. Anybody can go get this person's account number. And I can only imagine that you would have a lot more trouble than you think you've ever had if your conservatee gets their identity stolen. Oh boy. Oh boy. You got work that uh, you probably won't be able to correct in their lifetime because identity theft and getting that corrected is crazy. Anyway, let's move on. So just remember to, to redact out that little bit of information. So the next part you would tell the judge in your summary, if there's been any capital changes. So um, if the assets have gone up or down, for instance, let's take this because I know personally this has happened to me. It's happened to my father. The stock market because of COVID has crashed so incredibly. It had nothing to do with anything I did, nice. but in five years from now, a Benny may forget, I don't know how, but may forget that we had this COVID problem. So all of a sudden they go, wait a second, grandma, her stock was, I know, worth 500000 at one time. What do you mean it's only 100000 now? Oh my gosh, that conservator stole $400,000. No, the stock market crashed and poor thing, we're all in the same boat. We're all losing money um, unless you're an extremely lucky, lucky person. Um, so it might be something that you indicate here, um, d due to COVID-19, um, mm -hmm. there was huge crash in the stock market and, um, we show that the conservatee has lost a hundred thousand dollars or whatever. And, um, you know, things like that. You're stating it up front. Okay. So the next statement, um, again, is the statement of liabilities. So here you would state only if there is any statement of liabilities. Again, this would be a good place of, you know, tax or um, in this case, this um, person still owes a mortgage. They were on... Um, a mortgage with their husband and so they still owe this loan just because they become a conservative doesn't mean that they no longer owe the balance on the mortgage or half of it um so here would be a good place and then you're stating the monthly payments are this um there's no balloon payment things like that number 20 is special notice so what that is specifically is for those who may not know much about the law is say for instance, I am, you're, okay, so you're the conservator, there's a conservatee, and I am a distant, no, let's say I'm going to try and not do a relationship. I'm best friends with um, this conservatee right? I'm not, le it's, there is no legal right for you to have to give me any information on the conservatee, but I still want to know just because I want to know. I want to know that you're doing your job and you're not being flaky and you're taking care of my best friend. So I can file in court what's called a special notice and I can say every single time the conservator files any document or requests the court to do anything, or anytime there's a filing, I want to know about it. So I'm a I'm a file what's called a special notice, and I'm a force you to send me a copy of everything that's sent to the court. Okay. 
I'm going to pay a fee and it's a pretty small fee, but I'm going to pay a fee and I'm going to get copies because I want to see what you're doing. I have a right to that. So in this section, you are stating that there are either no special notices on file or there are special notices. So in yeah. the case where I file with the court that I want to receive a special notice, you would have to state, yes, there are special notices and I'm making sure that I gave them a copy of this accounting to and things of that nature. Okay, yeah. so we're getting to the very, very end and thankfully, because I've only got seven minutes. And so now we're done telling um, the judge a summary of everything you've done in that accounting and what do we want him to do or her to do, right? So I'm stating I'm the conservator and I'm praying that you take these following actions. That the account and report that I have submitted be approved and settled. That the acts that I have taken, which means sells a vacation home, sell the furniture, um, take her to get haircuts, stuff like that, that those be approved. Oh, I'm sorry, the vehicle and stuff is separate. But I've taken her to get her haircut, I've taken her to the movies, just you would just not state all those, but that's what you're asking for. You're also stating that the sale of the vehicle be approved and confirmed. And now it's no longer an asset. Okay, that the sale of the furniture and fixtures are approved. And so again, it's no longer an asset. That once the judge approves this accounting that I should be able to pay myself. And remember, up top, you asked to be paid $500. So this says I should pay, be able to pay myself $500. You're also asking that as soon as the judge approves the accounting, that you I'm authorized to pay the attorney his compensation, which hasn't been paid yet. And I'm telling the judge, and you grant whatever other order that you deem fit and proper. Even if I haven't included it here, I give you permission to grant whatever else you want to grant. If you want a grant giving the neighbor um, uh, flowers or anything else, that won't happen. I'm just using being funny. Um, but you're giving the judge permission to do anything they want or grant any other order. It has to be lawful. They can't just do it because they want to. Anyway, then you're going to date it. You're going to put your name as the conservator, and then you will sign here. This section right here, because there will be no legal counsel, will not be there. So that would be blank. And then there's one more page, which is called the verification. In California, you must include this verification or your entire petition order is deemed invalid, non-accepted. They will, the examiners will write back stating you haven't included a proper verification. This used to be where you could, it's odd, because you used to be able to write at the bottom of any document, I declare under penalty of perjury that all this is true and correct, and then you sign your name. Now they've added so much more and forced you to include it as a verification. So again, it would say, I'm the conservator of the person. This is the account. It is true to my knowledge and my belief. 
and nothing seems um, wrong, and then I declare under penalty of um, penalty under the laws of California that this is true and correct, and then I date it and sign it. It's extremely important. Again, your entire package will be bounced if this is not included. And if you ever get back notes, because say you forget, if you ever get back notes stating there's no verification, you'll, I, I'm tentative ruling notes, um, you'll know that's what this means, the verification. Because otherwise, a lot of times they'll say you have no verification and then you're like, okay, what does that mean? And then you've got to call somebody illegal and say, it says I didn't include a verification, but what am I verifying? Just remember from this meeting, this is what it is. It's basically you're declaring that it's true and correct and what you're declaring. So I have and a question that, my that. friends, are the end, but Rex wants to finish. I apologize, I have court in Pittsburgh, so I am now leaving um, to go there and go to court. So I Can thank I just everybody ask you a quick and question? I hope to see uh, or talk to you guys soon. If you okay. have any questions, you may call the office. I can quickly, if you can need you quickly? me to um, yes. verify or look at your accounting just quickly in most cases if you need it but i'm sure rex will go over that with you okay but again thank you very much for your time and hope you enjoyed the meeting thank you okay rex, so i just wanted to wrap up hello rex before you get started the, uh, i just have a quick question can you hear me this is the end of the class however we're available all the time. If you have additional questions later, send us an email, call the office. We can help you out. All right. uh, the phone number for the office is 925-934-6320. If you want to send an email, the email address is Rex Crandell, R-E-X-C-R-A-N-D-E-L-L -E -L at astound.net. A S T O U N D dot net. And we're able to help you with a variety of things a lot of income tax, um, probates, estate planning, um, administration of estates after somebody passes away. And we also do the court accounting. So I want to thank everybody for attending and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Rex, are you gone yet? Somebody is asking for you already. I can't hear. Okay. Rex. Um,